A very big hand next, please, for um, Tim Madre. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Oh. My mate asked me to, um, to speak, so whenever Anaki asks me to do something, I take it seriously. Hence this. Look, I'll use this just as a series of guidelines today. Um, not sure if any pictures coming up. All right. What I want to do is to give context to the tribal corporation today, the economic wealth of the tribe that we have here. This is the only slide I've got. The reason why I want to do this is I think this was part one of our tribal history. It's not an ancient history, it's a modern history that starts in the 1980s. But I think I need to background this so that we inform the present because I think, and Anika is of the same view, that part two has to happen quickly. What I want to do is explain the tribal wealth and how we emerged, and that really starts in the 1980s. By the way, can you hear me properly or is it a muffle up the back? It's okay. All right. Here's the point. Just to introduce myself, I'm an academic, I'm a historian, but my primary job is I, I head my village at home. Tuahiwi, 30 minutes in North Canterbury. Um, Anake and I were junior worker bees to this crew in the 1980s. This crew settled the Ngaitahu claim and established the tribal corporation. There's an earlier photograph, but um, it was late last night when we sent it through. I think there are three survivors, four survivors from this group. They established the corporation that we have today. Anake's father was Marere. He worked in the Waitangi Tribunal. If I can use an analogy from, do you read John Le Carre, spy thrillers? <laughs> Anake was um, George Smiley, we're Smiley's people. Okay, so I want to outline the situation because Anake played a key role in the evolution of the trust board, uh, sorry, the Ngaitahu Corporation that we have today. My father, who is there, filed the claim in 1986. And the trust board members that you can see in front of you were simply village elders. They didn't understand the term social enterprise. They wouldn't have heard of it. What they understood was small businesses running themselves within their own world. Um, two of them there, the leader is Sir Tipene Regan. He was educated at uh, University, Victoria University Political Science History. My father was an accountant training at Canterbury, but he thought he could make more money mutton birding and at the Friesen Works, and he went that way. I'll tell you something about mutton birding in a minute. Does anyone know anything about it here? All right, you, most of you know nothing about mutton birding. Okay. Here's the situation in the tribe in the 1980s. Roughly, there were about 400 members enrolled. The Rooninger, the village councils, didn't really exist in any legal sense. In fact, most of the villages and the marae were on the brink of destruction. They'd been, they'd been abandoned. Um, the local councils, which at that stage, I need to say, were very much the white death machine, were moving in, destroying our villages. And really, um, that was before Rogenomics hit our, hit our communities. What our people did during this time is they simply went to Australia. They abandoned our villages, they took off to Australia, and they're still there. That's the story of the Ngaitahu villages in the South Island. And that was before Rogenomics hit our people in the 1980s. Rogenomics, I'll explain, was a neoliberal economic theory. Great for the establishment of our corporation, destroyed the communities. So by the time of the mid-1980s, all of our elders, aunts, cousins, uncles, elder brothers, unemployed. If you went through the villages of the tribe, unemployment was huge. What they did is they all thought we need to create businesses for our own people that's within the communities. Their idea was tribal businesses, tribal economics. The gentleman there at the back with the white hair led and created what's known as Whale Watch. If you go right throughout the South Island communities during this time, everyone had businesses, apple orchards, everything. Most of them actually failed in the year. Whale Watch still stands. Now, 
The social consequences of what happened in the 80s was evident in the 1990s, and all you have to do is watch Once We're Warriors. And if you think I'm overestimating it and over, overstating the situation, actually, the marae that you were um, at this morning was created because the gangs occupied Christchurch in the 80s, if you remember that period. You had the skinheads over there, the punks over there, the, the different gangs in all parts of the square. And there was a murder in Christchurch at the US Embassy. So everyone said, better get them out of Christchurch. So the marae that you were welcomed at today was built largely by the gangs of Christchurch. That was kind of one of those social enterprises that went on. So what I want to do is turn back to our elders because during that time, um, we had roughly 400 tribal members registered. The villages were destroyed. The councils barely existed. No one had a bank account for, their, for our councils. They were a political non-entity. So here's the tribe today. It's worth 1.4 billion. We have roughly 50 million annually for distribution within the tribe. There are 55,000 tribal members, and our village councils receive 500,000 a year. That needs an explanation if you're a historian. <laughs> now, in New Zealand, there has been a quiet revolution. It was designed that way. We don't like revolutions that we see overseas. It's just been a quiet one. Here's what I want to talk about. Our parents who are here in this photograph, created the, they created the tribal corporation, but they didn't really have a corporation in their minds. They were driven by a future where their grandchildren would be self-employed, operating small businesses with their relations from the bluff, going to Otako, Tamuka, Tuahiwi, the peninsula villages, and up to Kaikoura, and we'd have a lost weekend over the west coast. Now, they saw small businesses. They kind of understood there was a tribal thing, but they didn't have it exactly in their heads. And this is where Anakir designed what we have today. The only corporation our elders worked for would have been Borthwick's and the Friesen Works. So, Anakir enters the scene. The Ngaita who claims up and running and here's the horrifying thing we saw in the future. We may actually get a lot of money and a lot of assets. So the first thing that Anake and our tribal leaders did is we designed an institution to receive the assets, which is the important point just made. Institutional economics is important. You need them surrounding entrepreneurs. The corporation was really only a vehicle that served the interest of what our elders wanted, which was this. Their, their grandchildren would be self-employed business leaders operating their own businesses because they'd have their own independence. Because they didn't want their children to have the legacy from the 1980s. I don't know if you know the 1980s. It was the same all around the world. Watch punk music from England, Coronation Street. You'll get an understanding. They didn't want that for their children, but they didn't want the legacy of what their parents suffered in the Great Depression. So the tribal corporation was established to create entrepreneurs. Right. All of these people understood the only tribal indigenous economy that exists in New Zealand. And that economy is the Mutton Bird Islands. The TD Islands down south. No one knows about this, but it's the biggest tribal economy that is completely off the grid. No one engages with it. We have markets in Australia, um, right throughout the North Island, right throughout the South Island. But there's something about the Mutton Bird Islands that we understand when we go there. First of all, we have property rights. You don't get onto our islands without property. Property doesn't rest in a corporation, big institutions, it rests with people. And it can't go beyond the tribe or the group. Second, labour and initiative. Our people and our elders were all labourers. 
they knew that you had to work hard and the investment's yours. On our islands, if you want to lie in bed all day because you've had a hard night, do it. But you won't get the profits from the labour. The other one is self-government. We have self-government on our islands because there's nothing else. We all decide where the houses go. Um, housing consents, the Resource Management Act, don't really occur in these places. It's the perfect free market because there's no law. The, sixth, the, last one, the second to last one is community infrastructure. The fishing boats, the helicopters, the, the motels where we stay, the whole thing is tribally owned. We all know this intuitively. We stay there, we shop there. The markets through Australia are ours. Last point, we control the market. So our mistake has been this. We have believed the rhetoric about a 70 million Māori economy. We don't have a Māori economy. We have Māori businesses sending our dollar direct to the white economy. We have eight Western businesses rather than create an economic community that values its own image. So here's a simple fact. The biggest landowner in the South Island is Ngaitahu. We pay more rates than any other group. Yet if I take you to any of our villages, you'll be lucky to see roading, let alone water and sewerage. You can't have businesses in your villages if you don't have basic infrastructure. If you want social enterprise within an indigenous concept, within a Māori tribal economy, I think you need to control the land taxes, possibly other taxes and duties. So here's the point. We were designed out of the economy in the 19th century, but if you're designed out, you can create your own economy as well. There's no reason why we can't. The tribal corporation is big enough today to give us the freedom as social entrepreneurs to do what we have to do for our families. We have the capacity to do that because we inherited that from our parents in the photograph. So the challenge for us in the 21st century is to create an indigenous economic infrastructure that allows social enterprises to flourish. I think we can do it, and we can do it in a decade. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tamari. Um, some of that history is new to me, even though I've been here a long time. So thank you very much indeed. There's some very powerful lessons there. Let me um, explain how we're going to use the precious little time we have left. Um, don't forget that on the app, um, there is a facility there up in the um, um, menu on the top left-hand uh, corner to ask questions. Um, so please do uh, put through some questions, and I hope um, in the short time um, that we've got uh, left, we'll be able to pick up on some of those questions. Um, and then I will be asking that poll again. Um, the other thing about this is that um, there's an awful lot of you, and um, food is a real social enterprise ecosystem out there. Uh, this is not some big corporate hospitality activity. Um, so I'm very mindful we're going to need kind of like all of the hour of lunch to be able to get um, people fed. So that's why I'm very reluctant for your sake and for the social entrepreneurs out there um, to go um, much only a few minutes after one o'clock. Uh, and not try and catch up all the uh, time very well spent um, on the welcome. But if I, if I could jump in with the first question, and in essence, really, it's a question for Peter and Jan and me as uh, Pakiha as, as Europeans. Um, we've heard wonderfully from Farmina and from um, Damare about um, their culture and the great learnings from the past. Um, what do we as Europeans bring through uh, from um, our past, um, seeing as that in some respects, in many respects, we're actually the architects of the misfortunes now. What do we reach back for? It's a really good question. I mean, I think if you look at the origins of the Industrial Revolution, where my first graphs started, um, you see the uh, origination of, of the modern formation of a company, actually. Uh, and that company, uh, architecture, has uh, unequivocally, really, over 70 years, driven the principle of shareholder primacy rather than community, staff, stakeholder interest. Um, and I do think that, you know, although the UK has an awful lot to learn, 
we have created a, a, a positive policy environment around social investment, around financing social business, uh, around how you construct business models that genuinely put social value, environmental value, community benefit, staff interests into the DNA of new business models. Mm -hmm. um, and I think whilst we don't have all of the answers for sure, and there are many answers looking back in history to indigenous communities around the world, how our forefathers and foremothers uh, did business, uh, we also have to acknowledge that, that you know, particularly the UK, uh, ha has, has driven a lot of the ill practice that we see, not in indigenous businesses, not even in small businesses, but in the, the kind of architecture of the global corporation. Mm. Um, so the UK has uh, something to offer. Um, I think there are some really, really fascinating questions up there around competition, collaboration. I think that for so many social entrepreneurs, we, we try and develop products and we need to focus on systems change whole economic systems change. We need to be much more ambitious about uh, you know, cr creating the markets that we trade in rather than just creating the products that we sell. Um, uh, and actually, you know, I, I, I always carry this burden of being a Brit around the world wherever I go. <laughs> I, I carry the burden of being a man. I carry the burden of being a middle-aged man, a white man, a British man. I just am burdened. <laughs> <laughs> Jan, would you like to unburden yourself in some respect? Firstly, that should never have happened. <laughs> the white male privilege, sad person. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Um, uh, I, well, I think two things. I think that, I mean, I really think about the future. I think about what does the kind of collaboration look like um, and what does it take to bring, um, as I said, old ways and new ways together but also what I'm really interested in and I feel like there were the threads of this actually in previous, um, may, maybe in previous centuries but I feel that we have atomized our work and so I love it, I absolutely love it when I see scientists working with entrepreneurs, working with local change makers, working with health professionals. I, I actually think that that convergence of not just uh, sectors, which we talk a lot about, business, government and community, but the convergence of disciplines and the creation of new disciplines is actually probably where the power is that collectively, and I feel like and times past, that was actually quite broad in our communities. There was a lot more um, interaction and exchange. So for me, the key is how will we bring these disciplines and these disciplines of thought together to go further ahead? Um, and that means absolutely fundamentally for me, it means um, indigenous and ancient and also traditional ways of thinking, but it also means how do you blend that with the most um, powerful technologies that we have because we have them to use um, to create change at, I think, a much accelerated way and at a greater scale. Mm, fine, thank you. Uh, Farmina. Yeah, um, I was just thinking how um, when I was um, studying at university, they pretty much told me everything I learned at um, secondary school was wrong. Um, and that there was a point where I was learning Polynesian history and there was the just drift voyaging theory from Andrew Sharp. God bless him. Um, but, you know, and then there was this point where, you know, the other theorists were saying, that's wrong. We're not going to teach that anymore. So where is the point where in our business schools, where we're, t you know, in all of our financial literacy, where we go, hey, what we're teaching is wrong. We've got to stop teaching it now. So, you know, where's that part where we start to get to those institutions? Otherwise, we're sort of around, our conversations are on the outside, and once a generation goes through all of those institutions, they come out and we're like... Yeah, that's not how it works in practice, you know. So I, I, th I think there's a split. We have to go, bang, that's wrong, and we have to stop teaching it as well. It's a really yeah. good. Really good point. I mean, it, it's just a really, really spot-on point. I mean, we are still teaching economics in our schools and universities, mm. as if the last seventy years of environmental degradation, inequality, 
has not happened. The financial crisis of 2008 has not happened. And what I find really optimistic is that students are becoming activists and yeah. absolutely insisting that their education curriculums change fit for the modern world. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it, in a sense, we've touched on the first question about um, a collaboration, not competition. But m can I come down to the second question? Is, is social enterprise the evolution of socialism and capitalism, um, or, and or capitalism, or is it a bridge between the two? Are we moving on to a very different kind of place? It's about market. So, yeah, Sorry, keep can, going. You, can you hear? Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. It's, um, I, I think those terms, socialism and capitalism, are just masks. This is about creating an economic institution framework for the community because everyone has social responsibilities. Now, the thing about socialism and capitalism, the real game in this is capturing the market for the community. Um, I wouldn't even get too tied up in that. It's, I suspect it's not even a bridge. I, here's what I've, I've learned from British imperial history. Okay. Um, the Industrial Revolution, 19th century um, British <laughs> economics, is fascinating because those British entrepreneurs in Manchester and those cities were committed and devoted to their communities. So the philanthropy that spread throughout those cities was actually quite local. Somewhere along the 20th century, it goes, it goes completely wild with capitalism in a local sense. But I actually think capitalism, in its truest sense, is fine if it's located in those boundaries of community. I mean, I'll come back to you on that. Cause, um, I mean, so so I, I agree, there were some fairly philanthropic business owners, um, but, but institutions are, are not values driven. Their DNA is, is structured for profit. And, and when people don't own businesses, institutions and institutional investors and, and you know, investment houses and VC funds start owning businesses, then the whole kind of morality of which business owners make decisions falls by the side. And that's why I do think we do need a third way. And I do think that there is, I mean, I am comfortable outside of my home in Britain calling myself a socialist. I would never do so back home for fear of being <laughs> driven out of town. But I am also an entrepreneur. And I think you can be uh, a socialist and you can be an entrepreneur and I think what we're finding is a way of driving markets actually fundamentally are just sustainable this is about good business sense because if there's no world there's no customers if populations are in chaos there are no customers to buy things so whether you're a socialist or a capitalist this this is just common sense um, very sadly because I'm mindful of the food trucks and everybody else out there. Um, but um, I'm going to close abruptly. Um, but, um, <laughs> but I know the conversations will continue over the next three days. And you'll see from these wonderful questions that we had on the screen uh, what sort of things are very much on people's minds. Um, and I, um, in this sense about uh, creating um, our tomorrow, and um, we're actually trying to create a new civilization. And by way of just sort of trying to pull together some of the themes that we've heard today, I'd just like to offer this quote from um, Roy Scranton. Um, the greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with mortal humility to the new reality. And that is a glorious new tomorrow. A very big thank you. Sorry, you. Yes, please do. Thanks. So our, our tribe is um, just the talk that we gave about. We it, it'll come, don't worry. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Right, our tribe has some, um, some presentations, koha for our manuhiri, the greenstone ponamu, which is a, a treasure in our tribe. The fascinating thing about this is this is not run for, by the tribe or corporation. The tribe has, has really, the ownership now rests with the village. The village has its own greenstone monopoly, monopoly now for the benefit of the community. So the dollar in theory 
moves within the community, more so than ever. So from on behalf of our tribe, we'd like to offer you these tonga. Thank you very much. Um, no, no, no need to apologize at all. Thank you for this um, very precious gift. Um, so um, we're carrying away many precious gifts to lunch. Um, so a, a big thank you to uh, our panelists, to Tamaray, to Jan, to Farmina, and to Peter. Thanks very much indeed.